Hold you on. a link in the chat one more time, please. No I problem. Uh, anyway, gotcha. Oh, wrong chat. Um, wait a minute. Wrong YouTube channel. <laughs> Today I'm joined with uh, John C. Wright. Uh, who is the author of No Wither, uh, the newest chapter in the Some Wither series of books, which is, quite frankly, excellent, fun, exciting, and uh, everything. Mm? Uh, the mm. newest chapter in the Some Wither. Oh, no. I'm hearing myself. It's the voices again. I don't even take medication for it. Anyway. Newest chapter in the Some Wither uh, universe, uh, which is absolutely fantastic, amazing sword play, fighting, uh, Chaldeans uh, practicing divination with the stars and astrology to determine uh, the future and destiny of those it seeks to enslave. In our last episode, Ilya Muromets had just by the skin of his uh, regenerating teeth um, escaped the king of Babel, as well as its high priest in their floating fortress, an airship uh, large enough to hold armies, and escaped into what could possibly be a dead world or a drowned one. How are you doing today, Mr. Wright? I'm doing very well. Excellent. So tell us about No Weather, sir. No Weather is the second half of a, uh, of a proposed multi-volume epic concerning one young Ilya Muromets. His uh, uh, life is not quite what it seems at first. He uh, He's a young man living in Tillamook, Oregon, who works for the uh, the mad professor at a haunted museum and is called upon one day to disobey his father and go rushing out to save uh, the girl he has a crush on, whose name is uh, Penny Dreadful. Her father, the mad professor, is, of course, Professor Dreadful. Uh, Absolutely. The just went entirely blank. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, sir. Okay. Uh, he has erected a Mobius gate in his basement, which offers entry to other dimensions. But unbeknownst to everyone the people who first discovered the parallel uh, time travel technology, the Babylonians of Ur, uh, come from a parallel world where the, tower, where the events of the Tower of Babel never happened. So they all speak one language, and nothing to which they put their hands can be denied to them. They were not scattered or separated into separate uh, races or groups. Uh, and the theory behind this story is, I've seen many parallel time travel stories where we live next, to, next door to a, time, a timeline where the South won the Civil War, or the Nazis won the Second World War, or the Communists won the Cold War. And it is never... Uh, two, two questions have cropped up in my mind that I don't recall any other science fiction writers having answered. One is, where in the world do you get the energy if you're going to divide the timeline into, into two? Uh, where do you get the energy to create an entire new universe <laughs> from... From every decision that's that's made uh so in this in this book i decide that only certain types of certain types of decisions uh that are major uh uh would cause a split in the timeline and they'd have to be decisions that take place outside the ordered universe outside of of the continuum of time and space or in other words supernatural miracles so i have so the the timelines are split not according to who won or lost a, a war but according to whether or not uh, one miracle or another happened in that timeline. And this, the, uh, because I figured that if you're going to recreate a whole universe, only someone who can create universes ex nihilo could actually perform the work of splitting a timeline into and creating two new, creating a whole new universe. Just going back in the past and shooting your, your grandpa in the head is not going to do it. Uh, the other idea was to, uh, uh, ex the idea that if you could have access to parallel worlds, you would probably intensely dislike your neighbors because the moment you make you make cultural contact with the with the world where uh, the South won the Civil War, and uh, let's say your President Obama goes over to to talk with them, he's not he's not allowed to stay in a hotel, <laughs> or or <laughs> you send you send uh, 
you send your uh, 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 your chief ambassador over to the uh, the world where the Nazis won, and they want to they want to see your ancestry before they'll even talk to you. Uh, What's this Italian? Not enough. Yeah. Well, no, they were allies with the with the Italians. Oh no, it's 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 a joke that uh, uh, I, I don't like. There's a long sorted history of uh, who's who's white and who's not, and of course everyone knows that the Irish were uh, barely considered white by the English during their troubles. Uh, and there's also a joke about the Italians as well. <laughs> uh, I I I do know some people who seem to think that Europeans are not are not white, but. Uh... They're, they're they're rather rare. Spaniards, especially, or people from Mexico, are, are considered not to be white, even though they're Mexicans. Even though they're they're, but be that as it may, as you can imagine, people from the world of Ur, which was never divided into races, would not be able to get along with us because the first thing that we would ask is, you know, what what's your what's your race and what's your privilege? Because we're come to think of it, we might get along with the Nazis very well because we actually have the same kind of modern philosophy, don't we? The first thing you ask about a person is his is his uh. This is racial background. Right. Uh, be that as it may. So it occurred to me that sideways and time travel would be as much of a mess to your life as time travel because everyone you met would, would be a deadly enemy. So whoever mm -hmm. first discovered it, uh, whichever timeline was, was, the, uh, was the most adroit at setting up your, uh, your parallel time gates, uh, oh would set to it to try to uh, conquer the others. Please don't shout. I'm, on the, I'm online. So that's what, that's what the idea of the story was, and I just thought, oh no no no, and uh, there was a th that, that that was the, the kernel of the idea, but the idea really got rolling. The the uh, the uh, the creativity started uh, firing in all cylinders when I uh, read uh, uh, a review of Dan Brown's novel, uh, "All Catholics Are Horrible People," I think was the name of it, or uh, something like that. <laughs> and I said, okay, I have to write a I have to write a novel where the Harvard symbologist is a crazy man. And the Catholics are involved in a secret conspiracy, not just to save souls, which everyone knows about, but also to save the world from like evil Babylonians, because you know, curse those Babylonians. Um, excuse me, they're not really Babylonians. They haven't been divided into any into any races because they're they're one people. Um, well, I, I don't know what so, you would call a citizen of the Tower of Babel. Uh, uh, that's why I used an Chaldean. Ur, an Urmensch. Urmensch. Yeah, because the one the one race. Ah. The, the, I, I also got inspiration from linguistic theory, which traces which traces language branches back to a root language. Yeah. And the, the, the German theorists who came up with this idea called it Ursprach, one one speak, uh, based on the uh, based on the name of uh, Ur of the Chaldees, where uh, Abraham comes from. Mm -hmm. So the um, uh, the, Ur, the the race of Ur uh, is known as Urase in in my book. That's what I call them. The other thing you could call them is pan humans. <laughs> uh, that's true. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, like many primitive tribes, when they refer to themselves as the one people, the Ur, and uh, regard us all as uh, unfortunate, disparate elements that that by rights should not and could not exist. That's true. So they have to conquer us for our own good. And uh, since, they can, since since it's the Tower of Babel uh, in the there's some evidence that the Tower of Babel is spoken of in the Bible was an astronomical tower, was a, was a observatory. And uh, so I just said that the, this timeline has a, a big advantage over all the others because they've actually cracked the, uh, the code. They've actually discovered the technology to, to read the future in, in as much detail as you can possibly imagine. Uh, and, but there's one, there's one group that can, that can evade their, their omniscience. And what the uh, the first person my main character runs across is a uh, a little girl who happens to be one of this immune group. Yeah, um, and uh, because they are baptized with a uh, new washing, yes, they cannot be okay. caught by the eyes of the stars. Correct, because they, they, the the uh, the Empyrean, which is above the stars, is is out, is out of their reach. Mm. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's clear from context. The, 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 the manuscript itself never actually says where this power to, uh, to see the future is coming from. But uh, the really strong implication, which will probably be made clear in a sequel, is that it's not a, uh, it's not a divine power. It comes from somewhere else. Okay. 
I can't wait for that revelation. Um, no, it's really obvious. Everyone can see it coming. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's already, it's like, uh, I believe she comes, uh, that stuff comes from the universe where um, Jesus did not follow after John the Baptist. Is that right? Yes. Jesus, well, Jesus did, is coming. He just hasn't arrived yet. He didn't follow ah. John the Baptist. Yes, yes. I mean, there's, there's I mean, obviously the, uh, the, all the prophecies in the Old, but everything, everything up until that point in the Old Testament is still true for that timeline. Mm. Okay. And he's not going to let his uh, he's not going to let his uh, his people suffer forever. It's just that that world happens to be in the uh, something analogous to the four hundred years that the children of Israel were in Egypt uh, under the under the uh, under their taskmasters. God wasn't dead during that time. He just no, hasn't no. had enacted yet. That's a that's very true. It also and... raises interesting questions of the Odyssey of uh, of why the good Lord does what he does in different worlds when it, where the uh, the approach is being taken the the order of the miracles is different <laughs> and no one seems to quite understand what he's thinking because he's god so that's true it's and true. it's I, yeah. I often t uh tell people that uh to not worry about it um because so it'll about what what <laughs> sorry to not worry about what Oh, about what things happen and, and whatnot uh, when it comes to the spiritual nature, uh, wars and uh, the things that, uh, strange miracles that we might see. Um, what is it? Uh, pray for it, but don't worry about it. Because uh, oftentimes people will worry and take away uh, what goodness uh, that could come from uh, them having to, uh, shall we say, gain character uh, rather than... Um, uh, have things uh, have the ease of their life preserved? Mm -hmm. Was that was that too? No, uh, no. You, you basically you basically you're you're saying the same thing my my book kind of implies. I mean, it, the uh, if you decide to make your your sideways and time travel story based on uh, the timeline splits when there's a miracle. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to, you have to, uh, if only indirectly, uh, address some theological uh, notions in the uh, in the course of the manuscript. It's true. It's uh, I make a joke in a, in a jokey uh, time travel thing that I, I work on with uh, David Halquist, uh, who you uh, who's also part of Superversive Press, and we'll have books out soon, and I'll have him on this show too uh, to uh, put him on the spot uh, where. Um, in Paradox Jones, uh, the man uh, hires a priest because pastors just tell him to knock it off uh, to consult him on his time travel deeds uh, to make sure that he does not uh, go too far over the line uh, because he's seen enough death to know that it's coming for him too if he meddles with the timeline too much. But that priest, he's, he's started to hit the bottle a bit every time he asks him a question about time travel. Um, it's it's something that's so hard to get right and you're you're you have one of the few actual like ability uh when it comes to actually writing this to handle causality and uh responsibility and miracles and god uh all in one package uh above far other uh uh writers um well, thank you very much. It's it's uh, it's you and Andrew Hussey has been the only ones whose time travel stories I've read that has not sent me into uh, foaming at the mouth spasms uh, well, of rage uh, when they. I feel the same way about time travel, and for this reason, the whole premise of time travel is sort of like a it's sort of like a looking at a, a, an Escher drawing, a picture mm -hmm. of one of those staircases that are actually impossible in three D, but in two dimensions, if your eye just follows the stairs, it seems to go up forever even though it goes back to its to its source yep uh, such a thing can't actually exist time travel can't actually work it's the the whole art of writing a time travel story is to misdirect the reader's eye from the point that makes it actually impossible <laughs> mm -hmm. so it, seems, it seems feasible it seems it seems like it could happen uh but the the the, the problem with that is uh human morality works by cause and effect if if if, if you're if you say uh, if A causes B and A is the means you use and B is the end you use, morality consists of trying to find proper ends 
using proper means in an act that's, that's moral. But almost all time travel stories force you into a position of saying, the ends justify the means. Mm-hmm. It, I have to go back in time now and prevent my friend from saving Abraham Lincoln from being shot by an assassin because my friend doesn't know that later on, later on in, the, uh, in, the, in the timeline, the death of Lincoln was a necessary precondition for some other you know, good event that otherwise would not happen. You know, let's say uh, losing, losing World War II or something. See? Mm. So, the, so the problem is that all time travel stories are basically uh, immoral because all immorality justifies itself by saying that the ends justify the means. Read, of course. Read Machiavelli, read, read Marx. Uh, and time travel is also uh, fundamentally uh, a wish fulfillment of trying to take back actions that you wish you could not have had done, uh, going back and changing the past. Now, I should say, there's two types of time travel stories, basically. Doctor Who kind of stories or, or stories where you just go back where uh, Connecticut Yank and King Arthur's Court is the time travel is merely a machinery for setting up a modern man in an ancient or medieval circumstance so you can see the contrast you know mm-hmm. that's not what i'm talking about time paradox stories are those that actually deal with the mechanics of time travel and the various paradoxes and impossibilities that would that would issue from that and it's always an exercise in cleverness to try to figure out how to make the time travel you have to have enough free will for your character's decisions to make a difference to what's happening but mm-hmm. you, have to have, you have to have enough cause and effect for the time travel to be possible say Unless yep. you're just writing a short story like Robert Heinlein or Alfred Bester or something, just to show that one of those one of those two things is an illusion. Alfred uh, Heinlein wrote a story, a time travel story where free will turns out to be an illusion. It's called By His Bootstraps. And Alfred Bester wrote a story where cause and effect turned out to be an illusion. <laughs> you could do anything you wanted, but it didn't matter. You uh, each person's timeline was like a strain of spaghetti, and if you interfered with your own past or created a paradox, you would turn into spaghetti sauce. Uh, you'd be able to see, see the events but not do anything, sort of like the, uh, the the bad guys in the Phantom Zone of Krypton from Superman comics. Uh, that was called The Men Who Murdered Muhammad, was the was the uh, name of that story. Hmm. So, uh, is, but, uh, so I've, I have time travel stories in the Mercury Anthology that came out from Super Wars of Press, starring yep. a girl named Cersei, because her, world, her life is kind of circular. And I had a group of time travel stories call, uh, from uh, uh, Tales of Metachronopolis. And in all of those, my 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 prejudice is not my prejudice, my my inescapable emotional atmosphere uh, forces me to just conclude. I think of time travel as basically wicked, and the good guys are always the ones trying to stop it. Now, I may have been inf- overly influenced by a book by Keith Lomer called Dinosaur Beach, where not to give away the surprise ending, but surprise, the time traveler is actually from much farther in the future than everyone else thinks he is. And he's trying to undo a lot of the damage uh, that are done by all the predecessors, including the guys who did events in the far past that led up to him. He's a guy who <laughs> actually doesn't buy the idea that the ends justify the means because uh, oh, I don't want to give away the surprise ending, but the book was written in the 1960s. <laughs> it's it's all right. Uh, I've got so many books on my on my to read list that it's. Uh, uh, that it'll just like keep growing and growing and growing, and then when you dig through the bedrock, you'll you'll never know what sort of surprises well, or ancestors one, you'll this find. This one is this dinosaur beach that Keith Lomer, I I think actually outdoes all the other time travel stories I've ever read. It combines more more paradoxes and more wildness and more uh, more reasonable extrapolation of what it would actually be like than almost anything I've seen. So hmm. the. Uh, the time travel story I always uh, go back to that isn't uh, from literature is uh, called Homestuck. And the way the guy does it is that he has, I want to say, six or seven simultaneous time loops rumming on. And any time a time paradox is made, the universe goes out of its way to kill the resulting uh, time paradox clones uh, so that they die in horrible and tragic uh, means uh, and preserve the main timeline. There was a story by um, Fritz Leiber called "Try to Change the Past," which had which had that exact same mechanism for really? preventing time travel. Yeah, a guy a guy uh, who is who is uh, Fritz Leiber wrote a number of stories called the Time War stories, where two two groups, the spiders and the snakes, were trying to manipulate history for reasons never told to their uh, to their servants, 
And one of the servants uh, is is uh, escapes observation and breaks the rules enough to go back to his past, and he tries to save himself from being shot in the head by his by his jealous wife. <laughs> he does things like remove the bullets from the gun, and yet somehow it still works. He uh, removes the gun, and finally he, he he changes enough things that there's no way the wife can kill him, and he sees the younger version of himself walk out on the balcony and get hit in the head by a micrometeorite meteorite, the exact size of a bullet. And then, <laughs> then he says, if the universe is willing to shoot you through the head with a meteorite, then there's no point in trying to change the past. Now, how that works out with the with the whole idea of this time war between the spiders and the snakes, apparently the the, the real time travelers, not the sorcerer's apprentice here, the the uh, can find some way to create enough changes to actually change the past. But there's apparently an inertia that needs to be overcome. And that's one way. That's one way of of uh, saying that time just corrects itself is one way of getting out, getting away from the uh, the paradox. It's one of the several. There's like six or seven basic clever things people have done to to escape from the logical impossibility of time travel and, and, and to try to make it seem possible. Right, right. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, time travel is as much a cat and mouse game between the writer and the readers, as well as the writer and his own logic. Yeah. Uh, so let's kind of. But this is not a time travel story. This is just a sideways in time travel story. <laughs> you do the parallel dimensions. And, and thankfully, your logic is simple. Uh, yeah, my logic is simple. My logic is that human decisions shouldn't split the timeline in two. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that means that every decision you ever make is meaningless, also. That's because true. Because they didn't make it. Okay. One, uh, one didn't get baptized, the other one didn't get, get baptized. The, which one goes to hell? Are, is there a different hell for every single parallel timeline, for every single decision? You know? Oh, that's that's a deep one, uh, especially if uh, you add some sweet, sweet Calvinism into the mix, where you just say they were destined to go to hell anyway and no, move on with your life. Sweet, sweet Calvinism solves the problem because then there's no, then you don't really have to deal with free will. The free will uh, is basically yeah. God knows what you're going to decide beforehand anyway. So what's the, what's the point? He just made you that way because it was his pleasure to do so, and you don't have to have questions. No, I guess uh, John, is what, is what Robert Heinlein used in Bias Bootstraps, getting rid of free will <laughs> to make time travel possible. I guess uh, John Calvin had read one too many medieval time travel stories uh, and was uh, well, tired of it. The problem is that John Calvin is actually a time traveler from the future. He went back to investigate the, the period of the Enlightenment when the church broke into pieces and got trapped there and then realized that he was John Calvin, but then he couldn't <laughs> change anything to get away from it, so he just wrote his, wrote his views that way. So, right, right. Is there any other blasphemy that we should indulge in while we're discussing my book? <laughs> Only that John Calvin is now a medium tier Calvinist compared to his followers. Um, <laughs> well, there's a, there's a time loop involved, I guess. Yes, yes. Uh, right. Um, so let's let's uh, move on. I was absolutely uh, uh, held in. How do I want to? What words do I want? Um, I was held in excitement, there we go, uh, by your action scenes uh, all throughout Some Wither and into um, No, no Wither as well. You have the proper amount of actual technical names for the sword swings and slices and his katas and all that jazz, uh, but you mix it with it. That excellent inventiveness, uh, down to the point where Nakasu pulls out a, a whistle and starts dancing a, a what I can only assume is an Irish jig, um, mm -hmm. up and down the vampire world's loading docks. Uh, how do you how do you go into those things and pace them out for a literary setting? Uh, I choreograph my fight scenes. I actually draw little diagrams either on paper or in my head, where so that I know where each character is during each part of the fight. Mm. Uh, fight fights themselves, I've never I've never been in one, I've never been in war, so I don't know, uh, uh, seem outrageously hectic from the point of view of the of the uh, participants, but uh, but the, the writer at least has to have a clear idea of who is doing what to whom and at what time. And the uh, anything you can do to ramp up the tension and to make things worse, uh, a writer is, is obliged to do. So if, if you have two men fencing, uh, it's better if they're fencing over the life and death of the girl, uh, and even better if they're on a very uh, uh, steeply slope, slippery slate roof, 
Uh, better yet is if it's the roof of a cathedral, because that makes it more visually dramatic, during mm -hmm. a thunderstorm while the cathedral's on fire. So oh, that's, that's absolutely that's top tier. Thing, so. uh, the uh, pacing is a, is, a, is, a, is a difficult judgment call, and, and writers have different, uh, different uh, approaches to it. Um, I myself am a, I just adore action scenes, and uh, someone once complained that one of my fight scenes, I think it was in the second book of my Count to a Trillion series, was 10 chapters long from the beginning to the end of the fight. And they said that was too long. And I said, there's no such thing as a too long fight scene. I, that, those, those words don't compute with me. It's like saying too much action, too much fun, you know, too much, uh, too much yeah. excitement, too much, too much adventure. Uh, no, it, it, it's the fight though, scene I'm thinking of. It's an amazing fight scene. I, I don't know what they're talking about. What what I try to do is uh, I'm a I'm a Dungeons and Dragons player from my youth up, and so what I try to do is I make sure that each person who is using some spooky supernatural power or magic spell has a clearly defined limit on what he can and cannot do with his power ability or spell. Or if he's got a weapon, I've got to know what the weapon can or cannot do. You know, I have to I have to actually figure out why a phaser can hit a man, completely disintegrate him, and not and not damage the wall behind him. You see what I'm saying? Or that, even uh, that's cause... my brain as a writer, even if it doesn't go on the page, mm. so I know whether or not if the guy's chained to a wall, will the phaser break the chain, or will the phaser travel up the the chain and hit the wall? Will the right? You know I'm saying because apparently, if you if, if if the weapon works that way, <laughs> you have to say what it does or how how it works. Uh, I have to I have to uh, if I say it's a particle beam, I have to 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 say whether or not it can it's going to heat up the target as opposed to just uh, uh, radiate it with uh, stripped alpha particles or whatever, you know. Right, right. So you, either, either in, it, whether it's fantasy or science fiction, the writer at least still has to know exactly what to, what can and can be done. And that right. way, I can it, once you the, the the limits on the thing is what makes the person is what make you able to use the 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 talent or the power cleverly. See, it's mm -hmm. it, it's uh it's a lot more interesting in a fight if a guy who has some special weapon or special talent. Uses it in a way you don't expect. Even something as simple as uh, the crowd comes in the room, and instead of shooting the main the main guy coming at it, he, he raises the weapon and shoots the lights out, so they can't see. You know, just even, even a simple thing like that, an unexpected an unexpected uh, you know head fake, an unexpected plot twist, uh, can make a scene exciting. Uh, also, set things on fire as often as you can, and uh, have a ticking clock leading to a bomb in the background. Uh, preferably. On the edge of a volcano, <laughs> right, right. Because you 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 want to have at least one guy fall into the fall into the uh, into the lava and die when he hits the layer of superheated air before he ever even touches the lava because the thing is that freaking hot. Uh, so but you still have to have the Wilhelm stream, otherwise it just doesn't count. I don't uh, know what the Wilhelm stream is. Oh, it's that one. Go. Wee -hoo 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 -wee. Is oh, it, no, that's not the Wilhelm scream. It, it, that's the, the goofy uh, scream. It's the uh, falling scream that the uh, the the sound effects guys reuse for every uh, every time <laughs> in, a, uh, in a pulp serial they throw a, a mannequin off a rooftop. Exactly. Ay! I got it. <laughs> I got it. Uh no, no. Uh, and it, it oh, just and that's, adds the, that's, that's another answer to your question. Part of the reason why I write my fight scenes the way I do is because I used to, as I watch as I watch uh, 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 serials <laughs> from the forties, I read pulps. Uh, if you want to read a good fight scene, read a Conan story, okay? Don't read it in the, while you're reading one of my stories because the contrast will make me look bad. But if, <laughs> if you want to see who I'm trying to copy and failing, because that guy's really good, read Robert Howard. I've never read a fight scene in his stories that would, did not have me on the edge of my seat. He's really good at it, okay? And it's not it's not easy to do. You have to you have to you have to pick your elements very carefully, and you got to you got to know where everything is, and you got to make and you got to make the ball roll quickly. See? And while well, while not confusing the readers to what's going on or who's doing what to whom, of course, I know you can apply it to all sorts of different situations. Science fiction, you know, the space station's going down into a black hole. The uh, you know the ship rate uh, ship's reactors detonating, and there's one escape shuttle left. Uh, you can apply these things to just about every genre and situation. The rule is, if something's going bad, it's the writer's job to make it worse. Of course. Because, 
That's what so, action adventure is all about. Other genres, non the non-action genres, romantic genres, have a different different way of piling on the pressure and for different reasons and a different outcome and different things at stake. But the the storytelling at its root is conflict. Storytelling at its root is a, a character that you like a lot wants something very, very badly, and there's some obstacle making it seem impossible for him to get to it. See? Mm-hmm. That's it. You know how to write a story. I mean, I, I don't know if uh, a letter coming in from Lord Cromwell's ex and a reactor uh, starting to blow is any different uh, between the genres. Uh, but <laughs> The form is the same. Obviously, the content is about as different as men are different from women. Oh, sure. Uh, but I assume they have the same effect. Um, I always, though, speaking of uh, thinking back on the disruptors, I've always wondered about the uh, nuclear reaction to these things when they just sort of like zap away. It's like, uh, shouldn't there be some sort of waste material? Uh, do you ever calculate that stuff out, like waste, heat, waste material? Uh, I, I uh, uh, am a uh, lazy writer who takes all his time by stealing better ideas from better people. But <laughs> to the mir- modern miracles of the internet, is so easy to look up either theoretical or actual uh, specifications for how energy weapons work, and some fairly hardcore science of how they how weapons that haven't been designed would work. Uh, that you can get yourself a very nice uh, you get yourself a very nice realistic, and I should say realistic enough for a story. <laughs> a way to way to uh, uh, fool the reader into thinking it's it, it could it could be that way. Because every storytelling is a bit like a magician's trick, a bit like a hypnotism trick, where the audience is volunteering to be, to be fooled into thinking something that's not real is real, right? And you don't want to break the spell. If you put in too much technical detail, it is possible, I suppose, to have a nuts and bolts science fiction story that has, that's too technical. I've read stories by Elrond Ford that uh, other people have said are that are too technical, but the, I didn't, it didn't it decrease my enjoyment. One of the best uh, passages of of uh, I've ever written a science fiction story. This is going to sound odd. Is Robert Heinlein's description of how a spacesuit works in the early chapters of How Spacesuit Will Travel. It is a brilliant piece of writing because the thing is pure exposition. Should be boring as dirt. It should be as boring as reading a technical manual. But he makes it fascinating. He makes it absolutely fascinating uh, as to as to what the tool does, what problem it's meant to solve. And how it's been to solve it. Please keep it down. I'm on the uh, ra- I'm on the radio, guys. Uh, the podcast, I rather. Should just, you can you can tell my age from that from that reaction. Um, That's all right. The um, where was I going with this? So uh, to answer your question, no, I've never actually sat down and done back of the envelope calculations for how to uh, how to uh, uh, what the power level would be on the uh, the uh, an energy weapon. Uh, I did uh, look up. Uh, a theoretical energy weapon for my latest book. Get the specs on that, and just magically wave my hands and said, "Okay, he can he can carry this thing as a hand weapon," without describing how the miniaturization would take place. Uh, in in the real world, a lot of a lot of energy weapons you have more heat in your hand than you do at the delivery point. <laughs> so yep. you have to figure out how to overcome that uh, that problem. But that was something that even that John W. Campbell Jr. back in the '40s was talking about. So a lot of these technical problems or technical drawbacks that you have for weapons and such are uh, uh, are well known. If you want a really good example of it, of the of a uh, of a fake technology with a fake limitation that becomes really interesting plot wise, read the Lensman series by Doc E. E. Smith. He asserts that you can have a faster than light drive only if you remove the inertia of a mass. So once the once the once the object is inertialist. Uh, it has no tendency to, re- to to stay at rest when you apply motion. It, it, it instantaneously goes to whatever speed you of any incoming particles uh, touching it. So uh, he just goes faster than the speed of light that way. But whenever the the the, the uh, field turns off, whenever the Bergenholm field turns off, the mass resorts resorts back to its original its original uh, 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 mass and speed. Excuse me, it's serial speed and direction. So you have, yeah. you know, so so now that's it's a completely make believe technology, and uh, you know, I would say it can't possibly work. But the idea it feels realistic because real technology has limits to it that that the the characters have to work around, have to work with and work around. 
So. Yeah. And it's like I, I had a vision of like a, a meteorite striking it just before it uh, hits light speed, and then it gets like knocked away because it has no inertia. Therefore, anything inserting inertia into it would like, like it, let's say on the tail, wouldn't that just make it like spin away? And so they're sent off into who knows where, well, uh, we, which would be a fascinating. The inertia experience. back would put back into it the tendency of an object in motion to stay in motion, or an object at rest to stay at rest. Right. And if the rest of the ship is still inertialess, uh, the ship would... Well, excuse me, you'd have to say what happens when you go from inertialess to inertiaful. If, like Doc Smith, you regain your original inertia, what would happen, your original speed and direction, uh, is the ship would be yanked in that direction, I suppose. Hmm. If you're not right. adding speed to the ship, you're not, you're not you know, like pushing with a tractor beam or something, if you, if you right. add inertia to it. You would make it if you increase the inertia of a body, it would resist being moved more or resist being slowed more than a normal body. That would be that would be kind of the same as if you were increasing its mass to you know, to, to infinity. I gotcha. So it's it still remains uh, where it is in a point in space, even uh, though the boots of the soldiers on top uh, in the, within the ship uh, would technically uh, bounce it around uh, if it had uh, no inertia, inertia friction. I guess I don't know what to call it. Uh, mass. Well, I mean, it's still fiction in space. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, I, all right. Doc Smith kind of hand waved his way around that. He he sort of said they still had they still had mass, but they just didn't have the tendency of mass to stay in motion. Ah. So, so if you so if That's a man if a man was flung across the room, and his his hair was messed up, and his one hair from his head touched the far wall, he would instantly come to a stop. He didn't deal with things like. Air, air friction, air pressure inside the uh, inside the cabin, though, as to what that would happen, or how to breathe, or, or how to do chemical reactions, <laughs> or that inertia. Because I mean, it's a science fiction book. It's not. It's not a technical manual. It's not a field manual. It's true. Uh, so let's move it back around to uh, no weather. Yeah, so yeah. in this case, with the, uh, uh, I've already read it. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, I was fascinated by uh, the mermaids and the sirens uh, that you had uh, set up there, as that's well good, as the... Good word to use for them. Oh, yes. Um, because, of course, fascination also means enchantment, means bewitchment. Yeah. Because the witches. <laughs> oh, I didn't... That's true. Um Sorry, so with I, the, I, 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 I added inertia to your question and uh, deflected it from its, uh, from its gravitational course. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's all right. I'm actually quite hungry. Uh, I have, as I told you earlier, I have fasted for a few days, so my energy levels are low. I will soon eat chicken wings until my energy levels are high again, uh, and I'll be perfectly energetic tomorrow. Uh, but with the, with the society, like obviously with the uh, Uras, uh, their society is, is pretty. You can figure that out by looking at it. Uh, then with the with the sirens and everything like that, uh, many times they're almost uh, villainous uh, in their actions and, and interactions with others. But other times they seem heroic. Uh, they're not a part of the ecclesia, which originally I thought the wisecraft and the ecclesia were the same people. No, 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 um, no, no, no. The, the wisecraft are witches. The ecclesia are churchmen. Uh, but of course, now we know. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, like the, uh, so like the early scenes where they're singing people to sleep and, uh, giving them, uh, drinks, uh, spiked of course with, uh, who knows what sleeping droughts, uh, it was, it had a, like the, uh, previous scenes where they, which it, of course are available on your blog at some point in time, I, if I recall correctly. Yeah. I, uh, I did like a free sample to, to try to drum up interest. Oh yes. And, hmm interested indeed uh where the they had it had more menace than when the vampires stuck their arms out to suck the life uh from those uh and their loading dock in the portal room i will tell you the, my thinking behind that all such scenes mm. in fantasy in the old days in fantasy stories and in in, in uh folk tale and and fables and legends upon which fantasy is based uh, and let me say parenthetically, when I say fantasy, I mean after William Morris, there was a genre that deliberately attempted to impersonate the storytelling of previous generations when the world was different, when, when, when the man's conception of how the world operated was Aristotelian and, and, and Dante's conception of the world. 
mm. uh, where magic was 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 a part of it. The modern scientific worldview disallows magic and miracles. Um, I myself have my own opinions as to which view is closer to reality, but clearly they're different. And the, and the science fiction is a genre which tries to portray the world of the future as we imagine it, though it's almost always based on an extrapolation of our current worldview, if that makes sense. It's based on a yeah. naturalistic approach to science. Uh, fantasy is, is deliberately nostalgic. It deliberately looks back at, at the past. But a lot of the fantasy, and, and, and the first fantasy, let's say before Tolkien, uh, had a lot of that flavor and was a little, the, the genre boundaries were wider. There were, there were more things thrown into the bucket of, of what counted as a fantasy story than, than uh, afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Tolkien was such a huge influence on the genre that almost everything that's not an imitation of him is a deliberate reaction against him. With the exception, I would say, of sword sorcery stories, which always, which basically came out of Robert e. Howard and his ilk and Lovecraft and, and so on. Um, excuse me, I've gone on a huge long digression. It's a very simple question. What was behind my thinking in doing the scenes that way is that it is, it is in most, uh, fantasy stories and most uh, even horror stories the villains look ugly and the villains scare are scary looking but in reality only half the things that terrify us are terrible to the eye the other half are seductive and look sweet they look charming they look alluring they're they're uh, uh they're the thing that madison avenue and modern uh, and modern propaganda deliberately tries to inculcate into uh into the human mind Looking around in the uh, at the modern world, in the modern day, I myself think the allure of of delightful wickedness, charming wickedness, is a lot more uh, uh, prevalent and a lot more scary than mere barbarism, uh, dinosaurs munching you, earthquakes crushing you, you know what what have you. So That's right. the Babylonians, the Babylonians. The, the Urase were uh, hideous, dark empire from your standard, you know, uh, <laughs> 101 central casting evil empire. Okay. The only reason I didn't have them uh, giving a, a stiff arm to Roman salute is because they uh, they were even badder than badder ass than the Romans were. Okay. <laughs> uh, and the only reason I use Babylon is because of the Tower of Babel. I, I don't have any particular. I don't. I don't myself think of think of Babylonians as particularly. Uh, uh, scary, but uh, they had some pretty impressive architecture. Uh, they had some pretty impressive uh, uh, kings and uh, emperors back in the day. So be that as it may. So I wanted to make a contrast between the Dark Tower and this city of beauty that is shining like a pearl in the depths of the ocean, because the enemy of my enemy might be my friend, but they're not really on my side either. So. Mm -hmm. So uh, my uh, my main character really has to deal with these lovely lovely women with uh, uh, he has to he has to uh, <laughs> sup with the devil with a long spoon is, is all I'm saying and they're not like most of the characters in my stories I, I very rarely have bad guys who are 100 percent entirely bad guys I do occasionally but usually the bad guy is a bad guy who every bad guy is a hero in his own in his own story in his mind he's everything he's doing is is for some for some rational reason he always has right. He always some some end to justify his justify his bad means. Uh, so and uh, the fact that my main character is sweet on, uh, you know, Penny, uh, makes it more complicated. And I, well, mm, uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, it's kind were of you, a breath of fresh air. Were you surprised when his brother showed up? A little bit. I was very much. Uh, and then you just started describing his, his armor and cool toys. And I was like, hoo hoo. <laughs> um, well, you know why I did that? <laughs> because right. my mind is the one with the, with the, uh, with the cool technology. Oh yeah. And it, it's like, it's like, we're looking at it and it's like, okay, yeah, this place has ray guns. This place has Zeppelins that can go to the moon or whatever. But then it's like, yeah, so what do we have? And then it's like stormtrooper armor, jet pack, <laughs> various types of weapons. And then he has his relics and then he has this and that, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, this is fair. It's just not available for the general public, I guess. Well, part of that, it's not clear from the text, but part of that is technology that they, they borrowed components from other parallel timelines where the, the other people had, had developed structures and substances uh, and uh, mm. uh, you know, 
So his his jetpack would be cool to touch when he takes off on it, but still a jetpack. We still do have atomic power on our world. That's true. Um, some of the other parallel worlds that were technological, I just I deliberately took from Russian, French, and Spanish science fiction stories from the 30s and 40s. <laughs> <laughs> no one's gonna recognize my where I'm stealing my material from, but the uh, 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 but the number of the number of parallel worlds that are technological is, is relatively small in my in my background. I have about 70 worlds that I made up, and I wrote wrote an elaborate list of where the timeline divided and who developed which technology and what miracle either happened or didn't happen to make it happen that way and which side they're on and how long ago they were invaded by the Urase. And That's true. So on and so forth. But I wanted to have each timeline be unique. Have you ever seen the, uh, the anime uh, One Piece? Of course. I love that. Anime. I do too. It's really good. And one of the things that the author does is every island you visit has its own flavor and character. Just as in real life, every town you visit has its own flavor and character. And he does it by changing the architecture a little bit, changing the, the costumes or the appearance of the people. And I wanted to have that in my story, even if there was a world that was only going to be mentioned in passing or in a list. And even if the reader never finds out about it, I wanted the author to know at least enough to give that, that place a, a, a character of its own. So when, so when one of the priests comes in to talk to Ilya Muromets, uh, He's from a world where the uh, the the only surviving uh, Catholic church is in Nagasaki, for example. Right. Uh, because Nagasaki was the center of the church in Japan until someone dropped an atom bomb on it. Uh, and the uh, the event that that I described that the the uh, priest tells him about about the martyrdom of a of a uh, of a Japanese Christian uh, mm -hmm. that happened in our world too. It's just the, the result was different. Yeah. I didn't make any of that up. That's, that's real. There's uh, quite a few stories that people can call on uh, from all forms of the church and all uh, walks of life uh, when it comes to Christianity, certainly, uh, where you can pull out these miracles performed by saints and uh, mere holy men uh, from uh, so, uh, the... Uh, driving out of the tr uh, snakes from uh, Ireland or from uh, my own experiences where you have humble Protestant pastors who pray over people and they're healed of their cancers. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, now, to, I, don't know, I don't know if every faith healing splits out its own timeline, but if it, it's a, but if it's a miracle in my, in my, uh, in my system, it should. Although I only have, I only have uh, usually major world changing miracles. I don't have, I don't have every time Christ heals someone in the Holy Land back in the first century <laughs> produce a new timeline because the, right, the right. timelines would be differentiated enough for that. But I do have at least one timeline that comes about because of a pagan miracle. It's a uh, uh, Siegfried uh, fails to get the One Ring from uh, from Brunhild or something like that. <laughs> this is where where Foster Hidden comes from. I forget what I forget what I said. What the triggering event was that that, uh, that happened or didn't happen in our world. Something about uh, the Rhine Gold. I think Pope Leo uh, uh, sends back the Huns. Yes, or something like that. That sounds right. It didn't happen in his world. Attila conquered Europe, and uh, so they uh, and he later made a deal with the Schwartel or something. I, I have to look at my notes. I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna publish all this in an appendix because after I having been raised on Tolkien when I was young, I love appendices. I love timelines. <laughs> love all that kind of all that kind of stuff. No one really cares about but the author. But there are some few quirky readers like myself who just. Who just love delving into the background detail, uh, and I want. And if anyone wants to run a, a role playing game based on it, I want to give them enough enough background detail that they can uh, they can conjure up their own stories in the back in the, in the uh, their own adventures in the background. I've actually uh, read the Silmarillion more than I've read the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Proper you know, uh, you know, have, a, have a shared uh, have a shared love of such things. Oh yes, uh, nothing more delightful than to see an author's mindset. Uh, and, uh, you know, sort of where he comes from and what he inspires and whose tombs he's robbed recently. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I am uh, perhaps rare among authors that I make no bones about who, who I'm robbing. Because for one thing, I wouldn't mind if anyone who likes my work reads the guys that I like in turn, if you want to see where I'm getting my ideas from. Because often, you know, the, the second or third Xerox of something is just not as good as the original. So No. 
uh, it's it's something I, I chat about with my other uh, friends in the in the Discord server we have for Superverse of Press, mm-hmm. and we sort of consider these things and how best to improve them, and to perhaps bring back some of that old knowledge, which isn't lost by any means, uh, but nobody seems to reach out to grasp the gems thereof. Well, I noticed that in uh, that there are a lot of parallel time travel stories, but I don't. I think I'm the first author who said I'm going to use biblical history as as the uh... As the basis for it, you know, and mm. you, would, you would think that would be not a unique thing since we're a majority Christian nation, and and have been and have, and we're more Christian than the further back you go. Uh, I don't know. I I guess people to avoid controversy don't want to do that. So I'm so I was a little surprised that I my my book was was characterized as uh, Christian fantasy. I mean, the number main, one Christian fantasy new yay, release. My main character is a Christian. That's true, but that's because his dad is a member of a secret Catholic conspiracy of interdimensional werewolf and vampire hunters known <laughs> as the Knight Templar, which in our world were wiped out by Philip the Fair in the in the Middle Ages, but in in other worlds still exist and still carrying on the good work. So of banking or whatever it was that they did in real life. <laughs> these are not the real life Templars, okay? These, no, are the, no. these are the conspiracy theory pulp. Templars, you know, who fight robot moon apes or whatever. Right, right. But well, I, I mean, obviously we have very few vampires on our planet. Someone must be keeping them in check. And it's, not, it's not obvious, so therefore it must be hidden. QED. That's our planet. Exactly. Tillamook, Oregon is real. What's real? Tillamook, Oregon. <laughs> the spot where I is true. here to come from, and they actually have a, a, a group of monks making fudge, you know, on the mountain that, that, as described. Uh, I almost want to see it myself on some journey. I, uh, like I said, every place has its own character. The, the, Tillamook has the biggest uh, blimp factory left over from World War II of any spot on the globe. <laughs> I mean, come on, how's I mean, how's that for local color? Right. Uh, I hope I hope I didn't get any details wrong. I think I got one road that I said went north to south. It actually goes east to west or something stupid like that. Oh no! Because I can't read a map. But I it's all ruined. Be, I tried to be true to uh, to to Tillamook <laughs> and to, to honor it for uh, for letting me use it as a spot where where my hero comes from. It's fantastic. I set a space elevator over St. Louis, uh, and go. have the uh, Gateway Arch uh, in ruins <laughs> in its basement, uh, just hanging there. Uh, I was hoping the Gateway Arch would lead into the space elevator, but yours your oh, is good no. too. Uh, it, it's, so. Uh, Ah, whatever. Uh, that's a that's a that's a that's a uh, superversive uh, stream for some other time when I actually release that book, uh, which will be after my next book, Tears of Alfland. But that's the future. The now is, of course, no weather is available on Amazon, and I've put links in the chat and in the description, uh, and they can be found on his blog and uh, on Superverse Press and on Facebook and uh, just about everywhere available to the Western Christian world and then to those pagans as well. Yes. Uh, do you have any final words for us, Mr. Wright? No weather is not the end, and it uh, it it, it... It breaks off in not as exciting a cliffhanger as before, because uh, my hero is now facing a moral decision rather than a physical danger. Uh, but the the story will continue, and uh, the next book uh, called uh, Captain uh, Captain No One uh, mm. is uh, is uh, has to wait until after my current project is is either finished or has uh, its first major major bit done. Is that the uh, Star Quest? Star Quest, yes. I, I, I'm redoing a certain movie franchise that we all know and love that was recently butchered by a certain mouse that we all used to love and have much less affection for these days <laughs> because I went on a car ride with my wife and kids and just the discussion among them as to what they would have done with the movie if they had to make a sequel to the beloved franchise was so fascinating that I wrote it up as a as a fake uh, movie uh, review from a uh, as if as if it came from a parallel timeline uh, where a miracle happened and the the Star Wars uh, uh, <laughs> sequel was good uh, and I got so much positive reaction from the readership of people who wanted to read that story I said okay I will write that story so I hid myself in the basement for a week just watching old serials and and rereading old pulp magazines to get the same 
source material that George Lucas used, and I was going to do. I have to change it enough to give it its own flavor and to give it its own feeling. But it's it's mm. going to be, you know, it's going to be a, a. What do you do after the rebellion successfully successfully crushes the, the Galactic Empire and there's a new generation coming along, and uh, they think the old evils are dead, but are they? Is the uh, is the question? Well, of, co- of course, there's going to be the evil son sitting there with a mask, brooding over his lost legacy and empire that should have been his, uh, with his secret fleet uh, and star killers and all the other good stuff uh, that well, one I, expects I, from such a thing. I absolutely have star killers. I mean, the, uh, the, the 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 son of the main character's home planet goes out on page one, paragraph one, chapter one in the prologue. Delightful. I murder a planet in the prologue. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to start small. This is space opera, man. Right, right. Build up. Oh, oh, we can go so far. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure, and you know, since that successful uh, crowdfunding campaign uh, was completed uh, so long ago, but so close by. Um, I look forward uh, every week uh, to some announcement or some release. Uh, from star quest as well as some weather as well as from no weather and i actually have been looking forward to uh captain nemo's uh arrival in the story in a much more physical way and all the other releases uh that you put out through superversive press and all the other allied uh people uh you uh grace with your presence and i want to finish my moth and cobweb story too oh yes oh yes the next, the next uh, will be a uh, tomorrow Moth and his flying submarine. Please. Please. Uh, I can't stand it. I'm getting hungry and I, I, I'm I going to eat food. It so long to rate these things, but I still have a day job. I still have a family. You know. mm. oh, oh, I don't don't think of it as any criticism or anything like that. I am merely uh, eager above uh, the usual level of eagerness. Uh, um, I'm eager above the usual level of eagerness. I, and I, wish, I, could, I wish I could work faster. Anderson Paddleton has commented and he says, uh, thank you for the interview and Awaken the Nightland is amazing. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to let you go, okay. sir. Thank you for our listeners for the surprise bo- broadcast. And thank you, Mr. Wright, for joining me to talk about No Wither. Again, check that out on Amazon. Have a good one, sir. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too, sir.